Whereas most philosophers worry about questions like whether free will is compatible with determinism or not, the neuroscientific attack on free will has emerged from a very different position, namely, the claim that consciousness is epiphenomenal. Most people would agree that we do not exercise volitional control over our unconscious processing in any direct way. But if consciousness is not causal of our actions, presumably our actions are caused unconsciously. On that account, we are like puppets, controlled by processing of which we are unaware. If it were true that consciousness played no role in our actions, for example, if we did not go to the dentist because our tooth hurt, but instead because of unconscious processing where pain is not felt, then it would be fair, I think, to say that there is no free will. This is because consciousness is the domain of volitional operations. As I've emphasized earlier in the course, consciousness has a dual role. In one case, consciousness of the world and our bodies in that world just is the domain of highly precompiled representations of what is intrinsically true about the world and our bodies in it, including teleological drives such as hunger and thirst. And in its second role, consciousness is our internal virtual reality or imagination where we daydream and play things out, either things that happened in the past, might happen in the future, or that are purely imaginary, meaning that they could never really happen. For example, I can imagine what it's like to be a dog or to fly around the surface of Mars. Consciousness in either its perceptual or imaginary roles is closely related to the concept of volition because volitional attention as the key executive volitional operator is the operator that operates over the operands or representations that we call conscious. Often we feel that there's a self, which is that which controls the volitional attentional operator. So we feel invested in the causal efficacy of our consciousness because it's where volition, attention, and the self, as that which controls volitional attention, carry out their operations. If consciousness is epiphenomenal, then there are no causal volitional operations and therefore no free will. Scientists, such as Libet, have argued that the very specific conscious feeling of willing cannot be causal. But if it is not causal of the actions that we feel it to be causal of, so the argument goes, then something else must be causal of our actions. According to Libet and others who believe his arguments, what is actually causal of our actions is unconscious activity that precedes the conscious feeling of willing. This unconscious activity is taken to both cause the subsequent conscious feeling of willing and to cause the motor act that follows a couple of hundred milliseconds after the feeling of conscious willing. Then some scientists make the radical generalization from the conclusion that the conscious feeling of willing is not causal of our actions to the conclusion that nothing that is consciously experienced is causal of our later actions. In the last lecture, I gave reasons to doubt that the unconscious processing associated with the readiness potential or the lateralized readiness potential is causal of either the conscious feeling of willing or of the motor act. And I also gave reasons to doubt the validity of the generalization from the presumed causal inefficacy of the feeling of willing to the epiphenomenalism of all of consciousness. But even if I'm wrong about this, let me point out that Libet's claims about causation are philosophically confused. Just because unconscious processing precedes the conscious feeling of willing does not mean that the conscious feeling of willing cannot also be causal of subsequent events. Let me give a concrete example here to drive this point home. Let's take the example of baseball. A pitcher pitches a ball over the home plate and then a batter hits the ball out of the park and it's a home run. Well. The fact that the pitcher pitched the ball over the home plate is certainly one cause of the later home run. We know this has to be true because if the pitcher had not pitched the ball, there would never have been a home run following from that pitch. However, the later event of the baseball batter hitting the ball in just the right way is also a cause of there being a home run. We know this also because had the batter not hit the ball in just the right way, there would also not have been a home run. The fact that the pitching of the ball preceded the hitting of the ball does not mean that the pitching of the ball was the sole cause of the home run. Why? Because the hitting of the ball was also a cause of the home run. The mistake that Libet is making in his logic is to say that the fact that there was preceding unconscious neural activity, which is analogous to the pitch, 
implies that it is the sole cause of the later motor act, which is analogous to the home run. But this is a pretty basic logical mistake. Even if it turned out that the neural basis of whatever is measured by the readiness potential were necessary for the motor act to occur, it does not mean that it was sufficient for the motor act to occur. If that unconscious processing were sufficient, then the motor act would have happened even if there had not been an intervening feeling of conscious willing. Nobody would say that a pitch alone is sufficient for a home run. So why do Libet and his intellectual followers assume that preceding unconscious neural activity is sufficient for the motor act? Libet's data offer no support of this claim. There's therefore room for the conscious feeling of willing to also be causal of subsequent events, either of the motor act or of later brain events. And assuming physicalism, the conscious feeling of willing just has to be realized in brain events that were themselves caused by prior brain events, some of which may not have been conscious. And those brain events had to be caused by prior brain events, even if non-deterministically, and so on and so on back through time, just as the pitcher pitching the ball had to be preceded by the pitcher going to the park and getting up in the morning and being born and so on and so on back into the distant past. So Libet's claim to have proven consciousness in general to be epiphenomenal on the basis of the special case of conscious feelings of willing being epiphenomenal is not only a radical overgeneralization from a special instance of consciousness to all of consciousness, it is built on a mistaken notion of causation as sufficient, when really we should be basing our notions of causation on what is necessary here, not sufficient. To repeat, we would never say that the pitching of the ball is sufficient for a home run, so why should we say that preceding unconscious activity is sufficient for the motor act? Instead, the pitch was necessary for the home run, and the subsequent correct hitting of the ball was also necessary for the home run. Similarly, preceding unconscious neural activity may be necessary for the motor act, and a conscious feeling of willing may also be necessary. To date, no experiments, to my knowledge, have shown that the unconscious neural activity measured by the readiness potential is necessary for action. In fact, it appears not to be necessary since there are cases where an action happens in the absence of the buildup of a readiness potential. And my group has shown that the readiness potential is not sufficient for motor acts because we've shown that a readiness potential can occur in the absence of a motor act. Moreover, no work to date has shown that the conscious feeling of willing is necessary for a motor act. Indeed, my group has shown that it is not necessary because in the case of hypnosis, people make a motor movement without the associated conscious feeling of willing to make it happen. In any case, the deep question is not whether conscious feelings of willing are necessary for actions, but whether conscious feelings of willing are sufficient to cause bodily actions in a normal nervous system. Is proximal conscious will sufficient for non-reflexive, uncued actions? We know that the human brain supports multiple neural pathways that can lead to action. Thus, it may not be very surprising if actions, even complex actions, can occur without immediate conscious intervention. To my knowledge, no study has provided evidence either that proximal conscious will can be sufficient or that it is not typically sufficient to cause movement. Thus, the central and most pressing question on which the debates over Libet's studies have focused, namely the causal sufficiency of proximal conscious will, remains untested and unanswered. Even if it turns out that conscious willing is not sufficient for some motor acts, and even if consciousness is not necessary for many classes of motor acts, such as reflexes, it would seem on the face of it that some conscious states are necessary for certain kinds of motor acts. I mentioned this example earlier in the course, but if I ask you to describe the contents of your conscious experience right now, you might say, my nose itches and I'm feeling a bit hungry. It would seem that your subsequent motor acts of talking about what you are experiencing causally depend on what you happen to be experiencing. To try to cut conscious experience out of the causal picture here seems fundamentally misguided. Also, consciousness might play a role in setting up global distal plans of action, like needing to go to the supermarket to buy spinach, even if many of the component proximal intentions and proximal actions that go into the completion of this distal intention or plan, such as pressing the gas pedal, are so automatized that they are entirely governed by unconscious processing.